everybody welcome back to jj tabletop this is another i guess kind of an installment of of table talk we have jordan from flute salute really exciting to see this person posting again on youtube um really just like a a positive voice in the community always level-headed and always really interesting ideas that get me thinking um so jordan thanks for coming today it's great to have you here yeah, a pleasure to be here, and that's a really warm welcome. Thank you for those kind words. Absolutely. So for those who don't really know you or some of your background, obviously we know that you, you love Dungeons & Dragons and tabletop role-playing games, but what do you bring to the table when it comes to you know your videos and also the articles you post on your website, which we'll get into again in a moment? As far as I can tell, out of anyone else doing like D&D content, I think I have the most experience with this, and that's improv comedy. And that is such an adjacent hobby to D&D. Like, being able to improvise covers a lot of different topics of role-playing, preparation, adaptation that DMs and players alike need. And so I, if I don't talk about it outright, it's, I, when I talk about a topic, it's probably because some sort of improv topic fed into it that, I was, that was on my mind, especially if it's something abstract like, my recent video about player agency being like the thing to focus on. Obviously there are some videos I've made and some articles about improv specifically. And one of my best videos I've ever made was one of my first ones with 17 tips for role-playing that are based in improv principles. I also dabble in like mechanics, deep things, you know, um, I could be called an optimizer. I have made charts about DPR. So I think that qualifies me in addition to just, I don't know, I try to be level-headed like Josh was saying. That was nice to hear. I think that does qualify you as an optimizer uh, to be having, you know, damage per round charts and things like that. But yeah, you referenced the player agency video and that, I mean, I, I had seen you make a couple of videos, I think kind of trickling in over the last handful of months maybe. And I always watch them and of course give the thumbs up like you're supposed to do if you're watching this right now. But I, I got really excited because player agency is probably the single most core element of this hobby and it's what really separates it from any other kind of like video game or things like that even something as uh, i think they probably did the best job i've ever seen at least in recent days is baldur's gate 3 but it's still a computer program running the show and it's not going to be the same I, I always like it when somebody takes a philosophical approach to the game because there's a lot of advice out there that really actually will kind of go against player agency, like the illusion of choice and all these things like, oh, you prepared this encounter, just put it behind this door instead. It's fine. You don't have to do it. They won't ever know. And maybe that's true. Maybe it isn't. But it it does. Uh, you can eventually it, you feel it. And I thought if you're watching this video and you're a player or a DM, this isn't just like a DM topic. Go to YouTube.com slash at Loot salute. Well, at this time, it's probably, I don't know if it's your latest video or if it's one of the latest videos you've you've released. And I highly recommend watching it. It was fantastic. As of now, it's my most recent one, other than the stream I just did last night. And so I don't know when this will go up, but um, yeah, search for player agency on my channel. And there it is. I just finished watching it uh, maybe 20 minutes ago. And I have to agree, though, I really enjoyed it. it. One of the things that you mentioned is something that I feel like I tend to struggle with, and that's letting your players fail or not necessarily letting your players fail letting your players get stuck i feel like that's such a difficult thing for me when you're you just see them not moving forward and it's like it's like i have to fix this but that's not necessarily the case i feel like you you might have said things before about the power of silence maybe that kind of like ties in together yeah i think so the the power of silence is not is not fearing silence like it's some awkward thing like let people think and if someone's not paying attention if the game suddenly goes quiet they're gonna be like why is everybody quiet you know <laughs> it's it's an interesting it my thing. turn yeah, yeah. <laughs> like every principle has its ex exception that's why i call them principles and not rules but uh, once you master principles then you know when to break the rule uh, behind the principle right and so um should you let your players get stuck i think the principle is yeah i think let them figure things out but if it's something that you as the dm like if you weren't clear about something like definitely clear that up and it's okay to also interrupt and be like um i love i love what you all are doing what you're talking about you're trying to figure things out do you want my help in like remembering anything do you have any questions for me that could help you move forward or, are you, or do you all want to just 
keep working it out. Filling silence is just something that a lot of times people naturally just want to do because there is an awkward like, hey, let's all just stare at each other. This is fun. <laughs> it's like, what's going on here? But it is true. Sometimes they're thinking, sometimes they're just processing information. I know a lot of times if I hear even box text that's like three sentences long, I'm like, wait, what was all the things that he said? Hold on. Like I can't tell you how many times Josh says something and it's, I am paying attention, but then I'm like, oh, let me write that down. And I'm awful at writing something down and listening at the same time. Like, I, I truly suck at it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I ask a question. And I'm like, he literally just said that, didn't he? <laughs> like, but, but that's just the human element of the game. And I, I really enjoy that tip. I, I think that's a, a good point of being patient as a DM, too. Like, a lot of DMs would like their players to take notes, but then they get frustrated when they have to repeat things. I literally, my ears stop working if I'm typing an email or if I'm writing a message. It's the same like, for just, me. Yeah, like, I just, I, I won't even register someone spoke to me until I put the pencil down and then my brain's like, hey, like someone was talking to you. And I'm like, wait, did someone say that? You know, and so um, if there's some note taker in the group and you see that people writing something down, don't be afraid to just stop and let them finish writing it down is, is what I found. And... Because either you're going to repeat yourself because you were too afraid to just let it be quiet for a moment, or they will get it the first time because you just let them have that time to write it down. And they didn't feel like they were missing something by doing that. So it conditions them that you appreciate them taking notes. Yeah, and most of our gaming is online these days. So Josh would be like, I'll copy and paste it into the group chat. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, you know, that, that's what it, I've been trying to get. It reduces with, my but... anxiety so much. I'm like, okay, great. I have everything not, I'm not... supposed to. <laughs> Not for everything, because I, I, let me say this first. So, so I won't do it for everything. Like if it's a list of like, here's all the stuff you found, there's no reason for me to not send it to you because I already have a list of that. Yep. But when it's a description of something, I don't, I don't love always sending those because I feel like some of the fun and, and even this kind of ties in, I think to something that in, in your last most recent video too, of like, you're going to pick out something as significant that I might not have thought was significant. So if I just send you everything, you have everything. But if I read it to you, you're going to write what's important. And I feel like that that almost ties into like the player driven world building where players are going to tell you what's important to them. They're going to help you build out the world. Um, so that's how, that's, I guess, where I draw the line when I'm sending things. Yeah, I think that's a good line. Um, descriptions, box text are often in the moment and meant to feel a little bit cinematic and repeating it is jarring, right? In those sorts of cases, I do think it is useful to prompt your players and say, okay, I've got a really cool description for this. Listen up, like put your pencils yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, just let them know what you're about to dish out and that you just want them to listen. If someone was busy picking out a feat because you just had them level up and they forgot to pick a feat or someone was, was picking their spells for the day retroactively, they'll be like, oh, okay, I'll listen to this real quick, you know? because they know that you care and you like bothered to actually prepare it. It's not just like you making it up on the fly. Cause that's another thing is players tend to respect something that's prepared more than something that's improvised. And so if you're reading something off from a book that like you, you thought it was cool enough to read or you prepared something that that speaks volumes. And so I think just queuing their attention up can be helpful. I think it can be easy to feel like if you're in the DMS chair to be like, okay, I am performing now. I am the, performer and you are my audience and it is a thing now that we must get correct or else the whole world and the game will be awful it's like you could say all right don't worry guys i'll repeat it if you want me to repeat something like it's fine you take taking notes i can go slower i have a question that that it's not part of your video but it does tie into player agency and this might be a little divisive so feel free to just say you don't want to answer it and we'll just cut this entire thing out Jake and I have a lot of opinions where, when it comes to player agency and just kind of like doing hit points on the fly. Do you have any thoughts about changing monster hit points on the fly, not using hit points and just ending a battle like when it seems like the right moment or cool? Um, like, do you think that affects player agency or do you think we should cut this out? <laughs> You can, you can keep it in whatever you want, but um, I, I do have opinions about this and it's been a pretty common talking point from channels much bigger than I and a lot of very upvoted Reddit posts about people um, just saying, hey, I just do the combat until it feels right. 
if a group likes that and they're aware of it, cool. If your players thought even like 10 seconds about whether to put one more point in strength or dexterity, then they probably care about that plus one mattering and whether they're dealing a certain amount of damage to monsters. And if they go into a situation where they really believe that they can fight anything because you'll either you'll bail them out or you'll just go and tell it's okay. So they can kind of dink around in combat. Like, again, if people like that, if they just kind of want to have like a little cinematic moment, use their abilities, they're not really into like resource management and making smart battle tactics. They just kind of want to do whatever. Then this doesn't matter. But a lot of players, they, they like to, like, why do people get excited about a nat 20? Because they're going to deal more damage. You know, and it's cool. They, and they get to describe it cool. Is it as cool if if you were going to win combat in the exact same moment if they rolled a natural one? That that feels like it, it, it cheapens the experience to me. And so I, I know that in a lot of DMs, they'll also do things that prevent them from getting burned out, right? They don't want to have too many things to track, and they just kind of want to do things till it feels right. But, but I will say, there's kind of an unspoken thing that I don't think a lot of people clarify when they bring up this topic. And that's like, what does that actually mean to make up or change hit points on the fly? If you've played the game long enough, you probably know like roughly about how many hit points you your monster, whether it be homebrew or not, whether you have time to like look it up and skim over to their sheet or whatever. Or maybe you're just kind of going, a harpy has about 40 hit points. And you're just gonna you just call it an even 40, you know? That's a little different. Um, like but if you know that a harpy has 40 hit points and they're losing and you decide it dies in 10 hit points, if they notice that. And they, and they will eventually. They they just don't feel like combat really matters. And I and I guarantee that after a while, unless you're like a really good group of friends who have a very specific gaming style, I really believe a lot of people will start to disengage and be disappointed because like they wanted to build a character that does a certain thing and succeeds and fails based on their choices. And if that's not happening, they disengage. And I speak of that from experience as a player because I've played in a lot of games where I noticed my choices didn't matter. The roles didn't matter, and I realized at the end of a session that was going to go about the same way whether or not I even showed up to play or not. And that feels like a massive waste of my time. And so that is the cautionary tale, I would say. Um, I'm not going to tell, I don't know, maybe half of the D&D group uh, hobby at this point or how, how many, however many people are into this more loose uh, DMing style. I don't know what to call it. Um, People do what they want. They do what, uh, what they can to have fun and not get burned out. But I, yeah. I do think some people shoot themselves in the foot and they wonder why they don't have long-term campaigns that go all the way to level 20 and span five years. Well, why would people play five years if if none of the choices mattered in those five years? Let's just start a new campaign with some new character. It's your role play of the week, your flavor of the week. You play it for a few months, you get bored, you start a new campaign. Like that's... That starts to feel more like an improv game, and I already do improv. And so when I play <laughs> D and D, I want to do D and D. It's a different um, game. It's a different game to me. Well, I can very confidently say the three of us are on the same page. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you you said that the most important caveat right in the beginning, if if everybody is on board with this and they're aware of it, you can do whatever you want. You can you know, on a, on a scale of one to twenty, you can make eight the highest, and if it makes sense to everybody at the table, then that's fine. <laughs> Yeah. In, in fact, um, so I'll, I'll back up what I'm saying. Like in my most recent session zero for my campaign I'm running now, I said, I'm going to run this game so your choices matter and I'm not going to save you and like change things on the fly or force you into situations. Like I want you to feel agency. And I, if you put, if you find like third party books that you want to incorporate, if you want to do st strongholds and followers and build a, a following and a monastery or whatever in the game, like, I want to enable that and have fun with that with you. Um, I will not be changing things just to make the random chance of the game not part of the game anymore. <laughs> so, um, and I told him that. And I think it'd be good for other people to say like, hey everybody, um, I run a game that's mostly improvised and I really want things to be mostly cinematic. So I want you to more describe things and worry less about like plus ones and minus ones and stuff like that. And if people want to play that way, they will play, right? And if yeah. they don't, they'll say, could we not play that way? And maybe they'd be surprised who would not want that if they really knew what was going on. Who knows? But yeah, because um, well, some people are new to the hobby in the last 10 years, right? And so who knows how they're going to feel in uh, another five years or how they're feeling already and realizing 
about their gaming style. A lot of people have been, it, it seems like a lot of people with the 5e have been kind of finding their niche and like uh, working a way to like another game or twisting 5e to suit their methods. And so there's, there's lots of different ways people are figuring out they like to play. And so people should talk about it more and be upfront about it and not be so secretive, especially as DMs. When I make a video about player agency that um, some people in the comments were like, what about DM agency? Like, you're going to burn out as a DM if you only do what the player's saying. I'm like, I don't think that's what I'm saying. And I do get, I, no. and I, I admit this, I do get tired of having to caveat everything I say because I, I, I trust people's intelligence to say, like, I'm talking about one thing, but <laughs> talking about one thing doesn't mean I'm saying this other thing doesn't exist, you know? Yeah. And uh, there's two kinds of people in this world, people who can extrapolate and, you know, so <laughs> I, that's how I feel about that. <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> I I think I like uh, some people come in and say like, "Hey, I want to add to this," but people are. But if someone says something like, "Someone used the word myopic with me recently," and I'm like, "I chose one topic. So you could call it myopic if you want, <laughs> but I'm not going to make a, a one hour video talking about every caveat in the world. I'm going to trust my audience's intelligence more than that, as you should." I think the the one way that I like to change hit points is this is my personal opinion it just adds to the fun if i have someone who like they just did a ridiculous attack and the monster has like one hit point left i will then say because most of the time i'm just using like average hit points if i'm using something from the monster manual i'll say to my players like whatever the hit dice are for that yeah. creature i'll be like everybody roll that die and if they roll you know, if we're deciding what the hit points are at that moment, and if they roll less than what the average is, then it's like, yeah, you got it. You know, it was still up to chance. I feel like it doesn't cheapen the experience. I think maybe it toes the line, but... Uh, that sounds fun. I've never heard of someone doing that. No, mm -hmm. and on the player mm -hmm. side of that, I can say I've never... Like, I'm fine with the results no matter what. Like, if I got someone down to one hit point, okay, great. They're hanging on by a thread and we're almost there, boys. Like, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, that's fine. And if not, then, all right, sweet. I got them. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually love this. So there, there are times when I say to my players, like, they're pursuing something. And I, I tell them, hey, roll a d20. Tell me it's, if it's even or odd, you know. And I let them decide. And, uh, like, in my most recent session, they were traveling and I have a table of random encounters. And I don't repeat them. But some of them are good and some of them are bad. And so I say, I tell them to roll. And I have a like, kind of like a DC in mind based on how long they've been traveling. And I have them roll. And if they roll high, I say, do you want a random encounter or not? <laughs> I let them decide, you know? And then all the players, it's kind of like this uproar. They're like, we can't survive another one. They're like, but what if it's a good one? You know? <laughs> so it's a, it's a lot of fun to kind of put the, the DM dice in the player's hands once in a while. Sometimes you let them know what you're rolling for. Sometimes you don't. And I think that's fine and fun. I love making the players be the ones to roll. Yeah, um, for we a had lot of a, we, in a, a game we had recently. We found a forget the exact name. It's it's the fake potion of healing, potion of harm, potion mm. of poison, or whatever it is. And so someone drank it in the middle of combat, and they were like, "All right, everybody, if each one of you roll a d6." And I was like, "Oh no!" <laughs> I was like, "We got tricked, guys." Let's... <laughs> I think I rolled a six on my die. I felt so bad. Yeah, that <laughs> like, was, I'm so sorry. That was pretty wild. We, <laughs> but it was fun. Character, drop to one hit point, then use a potion of harm. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was in a pre-written campaign. I don't. I feel like I don't tend to include those because they're just a little. I don't know. It's not that there's anything wrong with them, but it's so easy to find out what a potion actually does that. Unless they're just picking things up and drinking them, which is what this person did in that case, uh, they're going to find out. Hey, you, you mentioned random tables and like rolling on your random encounter tables. How, how often do you find yourself using encounter tables and, and uh, events tables in your games? Not a ton, but I'm trying to use them more for a few reasons. One is it's fun to just have the players uh, as an explorer. I think a part of the exploration pillar of the game, random encounters can be great for that if you make them meaningful. Like, it's, an, it's interesting in some way. There's some reward they wouldn't get. And also, if you're running experience points, I run experience points now, and I, I love it because, like, you can get rewarded, and players like getting rewarded. And so if they do have some encounter, even if it is frivolous, they can get some experience points. That's nice. It's not like, well, this doesn't help us get to our milestone where the DM will just make us level up and tell us it's okay now, you know? I also have... 
like I was saying, some positive ones where I don't want to shoehorn in certain like side quests and things, but I do I would like them to be available. And the the fact that player knows the players know that there are some random encounters that are um positive, like it's not a fight at all. It, it's just purely like you found something good. They they want to go out into the wilderness and explore, which people always talk about. And I've done a video about exploration being like this dead pillar the way 5e was designed. Like they didn't enforce it enough and it's awkward and not fun. And so I'm trying to find ways to make it fun, but they're simple. And I communicate that to them and how I do random encounters. And so like, like if here's an example is I, I played the, the Game Boy uh, Advance games, uh, Golden Sun. And in those games, you can find little genie, these cute little like elemental sprites that are important to making your character more powerful. In addition to them leveling up as normal, these things help you like actually change your class and gain new abilities. And so finding them and figuring out like the little puzzles or what abilities you need to get to go find them when it's up on that cliff and you're like, oh, I see there's a fire genie up there. Can I get it at this point in the game or do I have to come back when I have something else, you know? And so um, the players found one of those things. I, I like repurposed that concept for myself but using like the same art and the players were like, oh, and it was kind of fun because the player who like figured out how to like tame that creature, I, I have those creatures turn into iron stones, you know, the like iron stones in the DMG, those items that like float around your head. So the creatures kind of like, almost like going into a pokeball, you know, become iron stones for you. And the more you get, the more you're going to get like the greater iron stone effects. Plus I throw in stuff like, oh, you can cast mold earth now. And one of the players who got one, he, he always likes, he loves avatar, the last airbender. And like he likes any time his character can start to resemble the avatar, and so he loved that he got Mold Earth. I, I like that kind of stuff. I, I like finding ways to reward the players doing behavior that I find fun. And so I, I'm also doing the rules uh, for gritty realism, where it, if you're not in like a sheltered area, like a city, an inn, or like a really good fortified camp that's safe, then it takes a week of resting to get a long rests effect. Oh, there and, you go. And a, and a day to get a short rests effect. And so if players want to go into a dungeon or out into the wilderness and take that risk and start dwindling their resources and being like, do we want to go for the next random encounter, the next cool thing Jordan's got that we're going to find, you know, that's, that's a decision they can make. Or they could choose to just go back to the main quest, go to XY city and or some side quest, go to this place, or they can just go explore. And so I like that aspect of how I'm running it and the players seem to join it based on just like, you know, you see your players, you can tell when they're having fun. And yeah. these random encounters were so fun, especially when I had them roll for them. Like that was just madness. One tiny little pit stop I just want to make as a small announcement for this channel. I last night finished Avatar The Last Airbender, my first watch oh. through. So I'm kind of giddy like a little schoolboy uh, about that. And then you mentioned it. It was like, I, anyways. I saw you made a face. I was yeah. like, oh, oh that's definitely what that was. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Josh has been trying to get me to watch that for years, and I finally, yeah. finally did. But the other thing that I like about, or, or a way I think random tables can help your experience is to have each one, sure, you could just, just throw a few encounter options on there, but if each one has a way to tell part of the story of the area that you're in or whatever they're up to, I feel like that makes them so much more meaningful. You know, if, if say there's goblins, okay, like, well, how do goblins interact with this area? And that's one way you can highlight what's going on in your world or Whatever it is, I'm a traveling merchant. Maybe they're talking about weird taxing that's happening. It could be anything that can make your world come alive. And a lot of times the random table just sparks the imagination to get that that going. I know that's usually that's a Joshism when it comes to random tables, but I love my random tables. <laughs> yeah, no, they're fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I just get an idea for an encounter. And I'd like it to come up sometime, but it's not really fitting in with like what I'm laying down for like a main quest or anything. So instead of like shoehorning it in where it's like some random room in a dungeon where all of a sudden it's like, why is this creature here living in like the room next to this other creature? You know, it can be fun to just do something random and then try to figure it out. Like one random encounter I have is um, encountering some barbarian folk who are having a, a battle of strength. And the way that they are battling is by with their bare hands shaking fruit from a tree and whoever gets the most fruit wins. And so then whoever's strong in the party might be like, Oh, I want to, I want to do that too. You know? And so that's just an idea I had once, like I was watching a cartoon or something and I was like, that's a fun world building thing that like people would do as a feat of strength. 
I'd like that to come up at some point. And so instead of shoehorning it in, you're just like, it'll, I put it on my little table and it'll appear one day and it'll be fun. It also gets the DM excited when that's the one that, that happens. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I get to, like, I get oh. to do the, the, the tree shaking one. Great. Yeah. You're, you're like, oh, they I see your face idea. light up. Yeah. <laughs> Jake, this is, this is a weird question. Do you remember what you guys actually took from the dungeon in maybe session three of Ancient Relics and Hokie Religions? four years ago <laughs> yeah i definitely do that was that was a, a weird idol that we we grabbed that we thought was just valuable but yes okay. it was more than that <laughs> we can <laughs> say it that way that was a random encounter that dungeon it is one of the most impactful events of the entire <laughs> campaign it, it was we just so... recorded episode 69 baby <laughs> yeah very nice and it still affects things today love that some of the most fun and um and interesting things that have happened in, um, I guess, I mean, that, that's like the big campaign for me as far as DMing. So just in general, uh, or in that campaign have, have been from random encounters. Like we, uh, at one point they, they fought a hag and pretty much all of that I had pre-rolled, but I like wrote out encounters for what I thought would exist and or, or uh, wrote out tables for things that I thought would exist in this place. Um, the Savalier would. And uh, I just started rolling, and I'm like, oh, this is cool. Oh, that's, oh, wow, okay, all right, this all makes sense together. And then uh, had the players roll while they were resting, and one of the characters went to get some water. It was like a hag projection, you know, it was a green hag and a regional effect, I think. So it was like a, just some woman who didn't look like a hag at all. Yeah. Just some girl, like, wandering around in the woods. And what does my, uh, <laughs> what is, what is my player do? He he fills up his water and then his stream looks at this person and just says nope and turns around and walks away didn't engage with it at all and that's still <laughs> one of my favorite moments from the campaign it's not that just letting him decide to nah I'm not gonna I'm not gonna engage with that and that was it no good it will just, come of this yeah it was like the a day later. <laughs> Oh, by the way, I saw this thing by, by the stream. <laughs> and instead of me trying to, to push that, you have something that I think is really, it says a lot about his character and, and, and what he, how he thinks, what he values. And it's, well, we're already doing our thing. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to look into that because we don't have time for that. And I don't want to, but it's, it's not worth the risk. <laughs> and that's Mac, everybody. Yeah. Four years <laughs> later, you still remember it, and it's special. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if, you ever, if you've ever seen um, Lee from This Crits, but... Yeah. Yeah, he, he does... The stuff that he does with the green screen is, is just mind-blowing. Oh, yeah, he goes all out. He does a lot of editing. Yeah, and he thinks he's not good at it, which is... It's wild to me. Mind-blowing. <laughs> <laughs> Like I could do a little bit. I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lee's but, great. But a f fun fact, actually, we met Lee uh, during a live stream that I was a guest on your channel when we were looking at one D and D stuff, and oh, yeah, I think yeah. it was the Druid one because he messaged me like, I don't know if it was that day or the next day, or it was soon thereafter, and he was just like, hey, you want to you want to talk about like wild shape changes and things? And I was like, okay. And then we just hit it off. It was just fun. And I think it, that's one of the reasons why I love doing these videos so much, because this is a community game. And if you're not connecting and making friends and, and learning and exposing yourself to different ideas and ways of playing, I think yeah, you're just really, you're just selling yourself short. You're just going to stay in your, your little bubble and never grow. I think so. It's a, that's been a fun part of doing a YouTube channel for me, is uh, meeting other YouTubers or people who comment often and kind of get a feel for what they like and what they're enjoying about your content that's fun earlier we were talking about writing notes and we were thinking about not fearing the silence and things like that and i think i'm somebody who likes to learn more through video that's one reason why i like making videos but i've noticed that your videos often have an article companion to them mm -hmm. and they can be found on flutesloot.com which we talked about way back in the intro I don't want to leave this video without giving our, our viewers a chance to hear about flutesloot.com. If someone were to go www 
www.flutesloot.com and hit enter, what would they find? Um, hopefully they'd find a really fast website with just the right amount of ads to not be annoying, <laughs> but also like they can go yes. satisfied that they gave me a little bit of money by visiting my website. Fantastic. Um, but um, you'd, you'd see like uh, some of the top articles and videos from over the year on the homepage, but there's also categories. Uh, you can go by class, like different articles about classes if you want just everything to do with rogues. If you want to go to everything about wizards and find my article about like which wizard spells to pick, like the most generally useful ones, all that kind of stuff. We also get some weird things like when I just look at real life practices about like the afterlife or like funeral rites just to uh, inspire your world building, you know. So there are the things that are the like the breadwinners, you know, that have keywords that people actually search on Google, you know, like best wizard spells. But then you also get my improv tips my uh, world building things and, and like player agency like most people don't go online and search player agency D. &D. it's a uh, good to just kind of visit and just see what we're talking about and browse around a little bit see what you find for like dm tips or player tips or uh there's a category just for curse of straw and ravenloft because i love that so much and i talk about it a lot can they find those dpr tables that we were talking about earlier Ooh. yeah like if you go to my article about the beast barbarian or the one about the thief rogue i actually just like screenshotted my excel tables about like what your dpr looks by level compared to the the warlock baseline that Trian monk uses and it uses like proper dpr that's based on like your chance to hit so it's also based on like what your bonus is to hit and not just a flat like assume you do max damage with a hitting yeah. you know that sort of stuff getting into the real nitty-gritty of the math that stuff's fun and also i'm not the only art uh, art uh article writer there's like there must be like 10 authors over the years now one of which was uh taron pounds indestructible boy he's written quite a few articles that i've uh commissioned from him also, Dragna Carta, if you played Curse of Strahd and like gone into like the homebrew for that, Dragna Carta is one of the biggest names in it. And he has written um, maybe even like two dozen articles for Flute Slit at this point. Now he's got, he's got like his own website, but I was really grateful to work with him. He's a great writer and he's, he's got a great mind. It's also nice to just build up a lot of articles that are useful to people and see people complement their usefulness. Um, compared to other websites, you know, because there's other ones like RPG Bot and uh, the Alexandrian that um, I kind of see as like peers in the space, you know, uh, people who have uh, YouTube and uh, articles. And so it's it's kind of fun to see us all doing our thing that way. Just happened to hit the drop down on Explore Articles and I saw one labeled Homebrew. You got any fun homebrew things on the horizon that people should be checking out? Yeah, so I have a bunch of stream videos that are unlisted just because I don't want people to find my channel through those. So I don't want Google to like just go suggesting them to people who haven't met me before um, or been on my channel before. But um, the streams are still on the channel if you go look for them uh, for the Spellbane. Um, I've changed the name a few times. Like it was the Inquisitor, but it was like that sounds more like a Crusader. Then there was like the, the Mage Slayer, but it was like, that's oh, not just mages, it's like anyone who does magic. So the Spellbane is a class I'm working on because. 5e did a really horrible job of giving not, not only do, do like is there like that spell caster gap right where it's better to cast spells than to swing a sword like you just have way more options and then if you're swinging a sword it's, it's better to be ranged you know and so like not not only is that an issue um that that gap between spell casters and uh martial types especially melee martial types but 5e didn't really give great mechanics for like an anti-mage and like it doesn't it's it's funny that there's so many spell casters in D&D 5e but i'm baffled that they didn't just put a tag on a monster that says spellcaster that would be so much easier cuz then you could just in the mechanics say any creature who is a spellcaster suffers this effect from your attack but no i have to like find some roundabout way to classify it uh, in a way that's hopefully clearest to the player and the dm that would be using this class and then like you can like burn their spell slots and that kind of stuff but there's just the 5e doesn't have a lot of great mechanics for that and so i sometimes i'll find like a really wordy way to create a feature and then i find a way to do it in like half the words you know and so that's been part of the the process it is enjoyable but 5e really i don't know why they have a classification tag for shape ch shape shape changer on monsters but not spellcaster like why not put on like a few other tags in the game that would just simplify things and make it so people could do more it, homebrew it really would things. yeah this is an entire new class, or is this a subclass? Or I a class. I did release a subclass based on the concept for the fighter for patrons a few years ago. At the beginning of this uh, recording, 
Jake and Josh were saying that they saw me posting again. And yeah, because I was gone for like a year and a half where I just um, had life happen. And whenever I sat down to try to like do more content, my heart just wasn't in it. So now my heart's in it again, and I'm happy to be doing it again. But um, so I've been working on this concept of the Spellbane for quite a while. And before that, I did a lot of homebrew for like, you know, making certain subclasses that were in the game better because they mechanically like were not sound. And now they're getting redesigned for the 2024 Player's Handbook update. And I'm really curious to see if I like the fixes and that sort of stuff, um, which I am writing about. I've been going through all the videos they've been releasing about what's changing. And I've been putting my thoughts in an article that I'll publish soon to be like, is this update meh or is this one cool? Like that kind of stuff. But yeah, back to this, the Spellbane is a, a brand new class. Um, I'm currently designing three subclasses as part of that design, and I might have two more. And so when I publish it, I'm hoping it'll be a full class with five subclasses. Maybe I'll be content to publish it with one class and three subclasses and just m make more subclasses later with like an update or something. I don't know, because I'm not going to publish it. It's going to be a PDF that people can get. But it's been a lot of fun designing it, especially with input from the stream. You know, there's people with like, really good design shops like Phil Kearney who will jump in and be like, have you thought about this? Maybe word it this way. Did you look at this from 4E and see if you want to word it similarly? You know, that kind of stuff. It's been really fun to um, flex creatively, um, designing a, a whole class and its subclass is really fun. Well, I'm very excited for that. That's a concept that I've I've toyed with for, like, organizations, but never, ever thought to tackle it as something as as uh, as deep as a class or even a subclass. So that's very exciting for me, and I'm I'm going to be... I'm gonna have to check out some of those streams. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll send it to you when it's done too. Sure. But the, uh, I have like one of the subclasses uh, like uses a whip, so it's kind of like uh, Samuel L. Jackson in that movie Jumper, where he kind of like latches on to the teleporters. Because uh, that's the thing is a lot of spellcasters can just teleport away if you get in close. But yeah. um, this class is gonna have ways where you can actually like kind of like tether to their teleportation, so you follow them and they can't get away from you, like all that kind of stuff. Um, one of them punishes spellcasters for summoning lots of monsters. So if they do, uh, um, gosh, what's the, the what's necromancer the oh. build? Like um, just... the necromancer um, is a little different because it's not like a summoned creature technically. But if it, um, so, oh, okay. I'm trying, so if someone oh. like, conjures animals, like woodland beings, or, they have yeah. to concentrate on to like keep those creatures there. Then you can like attack the creatures that they summoned, and it and it hurts the summon and hurts the like uh, the summoner. So they can't just like summon a bunch of raptors to attack you and then like run away. It's like um, they, they follow the magical thread, sort of. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's also one that is kind of like kind of like a bare hands uh, spellbane sort of thing, and it's kind of like a life stealer, but they they like they feast on spell casting energy, and so they're not just they're not just like a knight who's trying to destroy spellcasters or police spellcasters. This one like actually has like an addiction, perhaps to um, spellcaster blood and like get my next sort of, weave fix. Yeah, you get that weave fix. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that kind of stuff has been fun to figure out because like yeah. um, I like those. Oh, which is it? Like top down. I always forget which which it is. But there's the top down design philosophy, which is, uh, and then there's the bottom up. And I forget which is which. But one of them is like you pick a mechanic you like and find a theme for it, and the other one is you find a theme or an idea and then you find ways to mechanically pay it off. And so apparently, I like the method of the uh, the theme or the idea first, and then figuring out how to mechanically build it. I forget, I just forget if it's like top down or bottom up, but yeah, <laughs> that's usually how I approach it. But once in a while, I come up with a mechanic first. And I'm like, oh, I gotta find something for this. You know, it yeah. kind of goes back and forth. I guess the uh, Mage Slayer feat wasn't enough for you, huh? Is that nope? Uh, my <laughs> very first character chose that one. Uh, and here, here's the thing: is uh, I like I lived this issue with like the spellcaster martial gap because i was i was a rogue surprise for my first character and i chose the mage slayer feat and there was one time this boss spellcaster went to teleport away from me and i just said to the dm i'm like oh then i won't be able to get him with my mage slayer like reaction attack because he's teleporting away could i do it like as he's teleporting like that feels cool and the dm said yes and that felt so fun and i got the kill so he teleported and then like dropped dead Cause like I got him on his way out, you know, kind of like that happens in movies sometimes, you know, that, um, 
and my favorite superhero, Nightcrawler, <laughs> is in the comic from that. Like as he's teleporting away, this uh, like yeah. Anyway, so yeah. Um, that just felt so much more satisfying, and I was like, Mage Slayer, the way it's designed, it, yeah. that ain't it. It needs I need I need more to do like the Mage Slayer concept, especially because I played it in Baldur's Gate two. The mage there was a Mage Slayer class okay. of a okay. uh, fighter, and I really liked how you gained like magic resistance as a percentage back then. And so I wanted to incorporate that in 5e, but like that doesn't exist. It's like spell resistance is just you get advantage on spell saves, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. So I wanted to have something that scales and like if if you roll a percentile and you get below your like spell resistance, like the spell does nothing to you. Like that sort of thing. I just I love those kinds of inventive ways to make what I want out of the game because the Mage Slayer feat is not enough. I'm, close. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about that i, I think um the strength of 5e is is also kind of the uh like a downside of 5e and it's the simplicity um everything is is advantage or disadvantage um resistance or vulnerability of, like it's... yeah exactly there, there's a lot of nuance that gets lost in there yeah. so uh, one of the things you said earlier is like a lot of people are in that point in 5e where they've kind of created their own version of it or moved on to like other systems i think 5e is great for building off of so something like that where you're talking about percentages that you could build up and and straight up have spells not work on you for it like i'm i'm all about that i think that's a a necessary addition to the game yeah i think so too people are gonna like it i, I hope i have no doubt with how, how much thought you put into it and it's based in experience i find that those are usually the products that tend to shine and be even if they need tweaking because of what what design doesn't need tweaking and playtesting but even if it does uh you know you could just bring out indy and indy's gonna come out and play test and then hermione's gonna come out and do some play testing hey there you go <laughs> jordan's like what is my <laughs> uh, <laughs> i kind of have a little experience we dabbled with some homebrew and we have a, a monk subclass that i Put together probably maybe three years ago now which is kind of wild that it might have been that long but it was way of the arcane disciple and it was just an amongst whose key would interject with the weave and so there was some fun stuff we'll put a link to it in the description but like what the capstone was similar to the quivering palm but you could like uh, i guess well it's actually very similar to like avatar where someone could knock someone out of their bending it was similar to that where like you could do something where you just created like this dead deadness dead spot for magic like you the spellcaster could push through it but it was they take necrotic damage like it was it was a, it was a fun little little thing so i agree there's not enough anti magic or anti mage builds out there because that would be a heck of an organization to to have like we, we police spellcasters that go rogue yeah <laughs> that, that organization mm -hmm. i want to know all about that like, that would be a lot of fun yeah, like uh, one of my first campaigns, I had an organization. It was like the the shadow government's lackeys, uh, the silencers, and they were the anti magic police. And that was based on the the Dota two hero, the silencer. But um, right now, the the world that I'm running a campaign in that I'm really happy with has a the gimmick I would say for the setting is that the moon creates an anti magic field with its moonlight. And so, um, like last time we were playing, um, the players. We're basically caught in a gravity trap, not a trap, but like a gravity effect that was making them float off the ground in the middle of a fight. And when it was over, they were like, oh, sweet, now I can cast Featherfall. And I'm like, okay, hey, use your spell slot. It does nothing because you're bathing in moonlight, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's it's a, a fun world building prompt. It's not just me being like, I don't want spell casters, so I don't want magic at night. Like, I just thought it was a really fun prompt when I came up with it. How would that affect the world? world? Yeah, exactly. I, and I've done streams <laughs> where I kind of say like what, to the chat, like, how do you think this would affect the world to have an anti-magic moon? And um, a lot of people thought it was exciting. Um, Wintry Wyvern, um, that channel, he did a, he does a, a podcast with his friend called Your Rivers Are Wrong, and it's all about world building. And I remember I gave him my prompt, like, anti-magic moon, and he was like, wait, this is legit. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and um it was kind of fun to talk with um you know about that it's a it's a fun prompt i really had fun i think people should find fun gimmicks for their world building to inform what they do i also like uh well i'm on, I'm on a tangent now but i also like like spells are such a, a big deal like people would develop technology and like cultural practices around them 
like my video and article about the dream spell, like uh, in my current world, people who are rich or prominent, uh, powerful, they often don't show their faces to the public and they're always like wearing shawls because they don't want people to become familiar with them to like assassinate them in their dreams with the dream spell um, or that kind of stuff, you know, kind of like a dream defense, kind of like Inception, how the, the guy would have like dream defenses taught to him, that sort of stuff. And so um, any, like every spell could just be like a whole world building prompt, really, because the real world doesn't have that thing. And so what would happen if you had that thing? What would happen if people could just create food and water all the time? Would they have? Would they farm? Would the government control that? You know, like <laughs> those are the kinds of things that I, I like to figure out. I think it's fun. Yeah, I, and the, I've I've often criticized. Um, I, have, I mean, saying Wizards of the Coast is maybe a stretch, but I'll just say high, high magic settings like Faerun and the Forgotten Realms, where there's so many epic level like 20th level casters out there and it just has no effect on the landscape it's just basic medieval city well medieval ish because it's not actually <laughs> medieval um but you also have like hundreds of people within that city able to cast wish <laughs> you know uh, i i don't know i think it, it would have a bigger effect on the world I know we've been doing this for a while, but I, I, you, you talked about your anti-magic moon, and I want to ask two questions. What ha or have you thought about this yet? What happens in a full moon? Full moon what happens in a lunar eclipse? So in this world, um, I haven't decided if there even are eclipses. It's my own world, right? So it's like, so people are like, oh, isn't the moon just reflecting the sun's light? And I'm like, maybe it's not. Maybe it's its own light. You know, it's different from our world. And um, for me, the moon is always full, um, is, is how I went about it. Okay, that's cool. Maybe maybe at some point I will bury that for some reason or another, but right now I've just decided to make it always full, and that's good enough for me for now. That's fine, because you can explore why is that the case. Is it scientific? Is it magical? Is, like you could, there's, there's a lot of fun things you can do with that. Yeah, and not only that, in your world building, people are going to have different um, relics and hokey religions about like what is the, the moon, and like why is it that way? Is it a blessing? Is it a curse? Because um, one of the things in my world is nature magic still works in the moonlight. So druids, mm. they, they can still use their magic and they see the moon as a blessing while people who can't see it as a threat. And they they might tend to focus on the sun while the druids worship the moon. And um, different dragons get power from the moon or the sun. You know, So there's going to be a lot of other fun things to do about how different magic system nuances you can play with as well as cultural oddities. Um, like, for example... <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a I want to do I want to do a video about like cursed character concepts and one of them would be um the sun soul monk but the way that they get their powers is by perennial sunning if you've heard of those people who do that in real life where they they get on their knees and they hold their butt up towards the sun and they let the sun go in their <laughs> and so um I made a a group of monks who they do perennial sunning and they're like the sun soul monks oh my gosh <laughs> that's incredible sun soul or sun hole <laughs> this is my son hole <laughs> oh my gosh i couldn't help it oh man wow wow see that's what world building is but all these weird things how i guess you can answer how they get their power in strange ways yeah i mean i you could have a cheeky answer like that and it's totally fine i've said it multiple times on video on videos but whatever your craziest world building concept is it's probably not as crazy as you think it is because there are cultures that still exist and cultures that used to exist that did the wildest stuff that you could ever imagine and yeah so just that that's just always my encouragement if you look at it as that to people it's like whatever your wild idea is just go with it like People yeah. have done crazier things or things that are at least just as crazy in real life. Yeah, I can't listen to like a history documentary without getting world building ideas or like random encounter ideas. Yep. Oh, that's definitely a thing. I've in thoroughly enjoyed this this conversation with you, Jordan. Uh, I also don't want to make the video go too long. I mean, is there anything else that you'd like to share or uh, tell us about? Like what's what's up with uh, Blue Sleep? Um, I, I guess I did. I did do a poll recently with a few different ideas. I said, "What would you like 
uh, flute sleuth to stream. And um, one of the prompts was my favorite spells, and one of them was also um, in Curse of Strahd, the book prompts the DM to try to make every spell that characters use more eerie in some way. And so that was the other, and both of those got good response. So I'm going to do a stream soon where I'm going to talk about my favorite spells and why and how I would make them creepy. Yeah, uh, when, when yeah, when cast in and Barovia, and then I'll probably take some ideas from the the chat to be like, what's this? How would you make this spell creepy? You know, um, yeah. I think that would be fun. But I, I I I do content. I try to do content that like a, a good mix of popular stuff that I but that I still care about, right? And then just whatever whatever's on my mind as I play D and D lately. What's what's got me annoyed and that I want to help people with, or what's been a big win for me and really fun that I want to share or what's just something funny like I, there's there's one idea I have that I, I want to do something in real life based on a monster but I think I have to get a sponsorship from a major food corporation and so I got to figure out how to like reach out to them and see if I can convince them to give me a whole lot of food to do it but we'll see well we're going to put all of your information in the description and uh, probably also in the pinned comment so not only do we want to hear some of your weirdest and wackiest world building concepts uh but we also want you to go to flutesloot.com and to youtube.com slash at flutesloot and subscribe to jordan and uh his check out his channel uh, honestly it sounds like you got a lot of really cool things from practical tips to philosophical tips dm tips player tips doesn't matter if you're into ttrpgs you're gonna get something from jordan and his content so please do that and then of course like, comment, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Jordan, thank you so much for hanging out with us. And thank you so much for watching. And we'll catch you next time on the next episode of Table Talk with someone. Maybe it's you and you just have to reach out and say hi, and then we could be friends. That's how it goes. True. That is how it goes. Take care, everybody. <laughs>